I was just told to take my earring off because it interfered with the microphone. I think if women designed these microphones, that wouldn't be an issue. But When Abigail Disney was 10 years old, she wanted to be a trainer of killer whales at SeaWorld. And if that didn't work out, she wanted to become an Olympic gold medalist in pole vault, become president of the United States at the same time, and also win an Oscar, all at the same time. I think leaning in was never a problem for this little girl. But as she grew up, she went for something perhaps even more ambitious. Capture the human essence of two millennial scale issues on film, gender and war. Gender inequality is something that dawned on her slowly, she says. First, she saw the unfairness of it, and she identified with it. Then she saw something different. She noticed that women act differently, that they did, some, did something differently, that they did things that sometimes didn't just help themselves, that helped others as well. War, by contrast, was something that always fascinated her. She wrote her PhD on war novels. Now she makes films about war. It is the irrationality, the futility, and the cruelty of it, she said, that she couldn't get her head around. Her message is clear. War is not a phenomenon. It is a choice. It is a behavior. It is, in her words, never good. Her heroes are women like Malala, women who fight violence. She just had lunch with Malala a couple of days ago. Or Leima Bowie, the Liberian peace activist about whom she made her first film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Abigail has met them all, her female heroines. She says she's been very lucky in her life, which, of course, is a very female thing to say. I suspect it doesn't have all that much to do with luck. Her PBS miniseries on women, war, and peace is truly a gem, and we'll see a little bit of it in a minute. And I'm already looking forward to seeing what she's working on next, Women in the Arab Spring. Yes, in case you did wonder, Abigail is the great niece of Walt Disney. But perhaps I should say that Walt was the great uncle of Abigail Disney. Please welcome Abigail Disney, filmmaker, philanthropist, and would-be trainer of killer whales. Up to you. So, so somewhere in Southern California, Walt just rolled in his grave. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to start you with a little two-minute clip from Women, War, and Peace, which was um, on um, public television in the United States about two years ago. Um, I've never really entirely understood why it is that I find myself talking about war so much. I don't never fought myself. I don't uh, have family that fought. Um, but I think lately I'm coming to realize it's because it's sort of the crucible of social values particularly in modern times. It's where you see the absolute worst of humanity. It's bottled madness, ritualized and expensive bottled madness. Um, but it is also where you see people rise um, and show you the best of what they have in them. So let's go ahead and roll the clip and then I'll tell you more. We live in fear. When I go out of the house in the morning, I say goodbye to my children and my family because I say that I never know whether I'm coming alive back home or not. If you look at the frontline discussion of force, the troops, the politics, the borders, the weapons, the armies, that is a men's story. How you actually exist and continue on living in war, that's a woman's story. And that story has never been told. Uh, there are no front lines in the wars in today's world. The fact is, the primary victims are women and children. Civilians are not, quote, collateral damage, as we once called them, but really uh, very much in the center of the war zone. Women, although they are not necessarily the combatants, are often the victims. In contemporary wars, the tactic is killing or raping women. This is a very nasty weapon of war. It has probably become more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier in an armed conflict. The work of Afghan women will be essential to this country's success. We will struggle. We cannot do anything alone. The world has to support us in this. 
This is not the first case where rape has been charged as a war crime, but it is the first case where rape has been charged as a crime against humanity. What we've done here today is to send out a signal to the world that we, the Liberian women in Ghana, we are tired of fighting the killing of our people. If I should get killed, just remember me that I was fighting for peace. Ultimately, it's going to take reconciliation among people in order to get societies that function and that women are treated with respect. That is what this century is going to be about. So those films, among others, I think contain everything you need to know uh, about women in leadership and why we care, why it matters. So I'm going to start with a story that is from the best known of the five films that we made, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Um, it's the film from which Lema Bowie emerged and eventually won the Nobel Peace Prize. So it was 2003, and the Liberian women were looking to stop the fighting that had gone on and on, endless, unspeakable slaughter of everything important and everyone that they treasured. And they had reached a point of total exasperation. There was no amount of appealing to reason or decency that would seem to get these men's attention. And they just continued along regardless of the cost to their countrymen on the ground. And yes, if you want to note a parallel with my own government um, at the moment, you're encouraged to do so. There's slightly less blood in Washington today, but a similar kind of savagery. Um, so in one final act of desperation, the women locked arms and they sent a note inside the room and the note said, we're taking you all hostage for the women of Liberia. And when security came to arrest them, they said, who is the leader of this group? And Lema stepped forward and started to strip naked. And in deference to Lema's dignity, security refused to arrest her. And what followed after that moment was an extraordinary number of dynamical changes and shifts in the peace talks themselves which ultimately resulted in a peace agreement being signed two years, two weeks later, a peace agreement that holds 10 years later the longest unbroken span of peace in the modern history of Liberia. So in 2006, when Jeannie Redeker and I were there making a film about these women, I had the opportunity to talk to one of the warlords who'd been present in that room, and I said to him, how is it possible that given that 50% or more of the women in your country have been raped, so clearly, there's no respect for their sexual self-determination. There's no respect, certainly, for their dignity. How is it possible that in the midst of that kind of context, one woman threatening to strip naked could possibly bring the whole thing to a stop that way? And he looked at me like I had 12 heads and maybe was the stupidest person in the world. He said, because they were our mothers. And I still didn't really understand, so he went on. He said, you'd have to ask yourself, what would cause your mother to give away that last shred of her dignity like that? He said it was impossible for us to continue. And then he continued on, and he said these words that I will never forget. They have haunted me ever since. He said, you would have to ask yourself, I, sorry, it, there, in that moment, there was not one man in that room who did not ask himself, what have I done to bring us to this point? What is my role in solving this problem? Now that's an extraordinary moment in any political crisis to bring everybody to that point. And import, it's important to know that before any of this had even happened, the women had been, and this is gonna sound strange to you, offered, been offered a seat at the table, which they had turned down. Now they had turned that seat down a few weeks prior to all this, precisely because of the understanding that they had that as market women, as refugee women, as women that weren't of the class of the people who were speaking in that room, they would all really be working with minimal amounts of credibility. And that they would have to let go of so much of the nature of their discourse to be in that room and to hold on to any credibility that they would never be able to speak in the language they were comfortable speaking in. Because after all, peace talks, are a lot like business meetings and legislative sessions and international conferences, and is an act of the worst, most rank uncollegiality 
to say naive and morally frank things like stop killing the children. And I'm sure you have all had a moment of seeing a colleague, a woman or a man, simply throw away their last shreds of personal capital on an appeal to morality or decency in such a setting. The kind of appeals that are swept aside so quickly as unprofessional or unsophisticated and distractingly naive. The women of Liberia turned down a seat at the table and instead chose to stay outside of the room and seek to penetrate the conversation in there with the whole weight of their moral appeal intact and undiluted. And while they were forced to persist so much longer than others might have, and to sit through the taunting of the warlords as they came and went from the room, they believed in the power of their point of view and they were not leaving until they'd been heard. So I tell you this story because I think it contains everything you need to know about the hope of women's leadership in the coming century. Because the hope for women's leadership is not that we transform the demographics of the people in the room, but that in coming into the room, the room itself is changed and changed forever. A woman's voice has a special resonance in almost every heart. Not everyone is that lucky, but the vast majority of us, a woman's voice is the first voice we hear. It's the first voice that tells us they love us. It's the first voice that tells us we're going to be safe, that everything is going to be all right. It's the first voice that says, don't hit, don't be rude, share your things. It's the civilizing voice. And when it's used in certain circumstances, it can carry an enormous resonancy. So now it's right when I'm talking about this aspect of things that somebody always brings up Margaret Thatcher. She always gets trotted out as proof, game, set, and match, that if women were to run the world, you know, we'd be a mess. My friend Gloria Steinem always calls her a female impersonator. <laughs> and it's true if we swapped out every Dick Cheney and George Bush for a Sarah Palin and a Margaret Thatcher, we would be a mess. But of course, that's a total misapprehension, usually disingenuous, of, of the whole idea of what I'm talking about. Instead, try this thought exercise. Imagine the U.S. government shutdown that we're now facing and the talks going on around Washington right now. And imagine that you took each and every one of those, I'm sorry, I can't think of a better word, but idiots out and replaced him and sometimes her with someone who just finished shopping for food for her family, somebody who just put her child to sleep in a homeless shelter or a refugee camp or just got home after spending the day caring for an elder who was sick or a PTA meeting where you're trying to figure out to get enough books for the kids in school. If you can imagine these women, and sometimes men, in place of Harry Reid and John Boehner and Ted Cruz, do you really think that this mess would have gone on for so long? Do you really think it would be so easy to continue to spend 58% of our budget on military and yet accuse the unemployed who are asking for food stamps of just being lazy malingerers? And no, the clouds will not part and the angels will not sing when women move into leadership and unintended consequences will occur and there will still be problems. But isn't it difficult to imagine that your mother would not have kicked John Boehner's butt by now? So just look at human history, think about it. Has there ever been a more gendered activity than war? Has there ever been a more gendered activity than governance? Has there ever been a more gendered activity until very recently than business? It's foolish to suggest that all women are intuitive and peaceful and nice and verbal. It's foolish to suggest that all men are rational and they get math better than we do and they fix leaky pipes really well. This is a silly assertion. But at the level of what is general rather than what is individual, it's ridiculous to think that these general differences will not persist undeniably. And the corollary to that is if women are to move into power in large enough numbers to balance men's voices with their own, perhaps there'd be a moment at which these general differences might just start to kick in. And dynamics and paradigms and processes might just start to shift. And rooms full of half women leading side by side with men might even be very freeing for the men in them because after all, won't there be a, a few fewer meetings at strip clubs locker rooms and sports bars, and less conversation about the relative size and merits of people's private parts. 
and what's more, the activities to which women have been consigned during all the years that they've been designed out of power have involved the universal drudgery of finding food and water and housing and shelter, education, caring for the sick, the elderly, and generally making sure that the human race is thriving. Women's lives are almost always consumed by what, for a want of a better word, is peace. That is the bread and butter of what they do now and have done throughout history and with a scant handful of scarce exceptions. Peace is the necessary precondition for their success in life. And frankly, I could not care less whether these differences are on the second X chromosome, whether they were created by evolutionary necessity, whether they're in the estrogen or the Diet Coke, I don't care. They're there and they're undeniable. So doesn't it stand to reason? If you think about it, there should be food and water, if you think there should be food and water and education and peace for the people of our planet, we might want more of the people who for millennia have displayed a strong inclination toward these things to offer us their thoughts and leadership on how to get that done. And likewise, shouldn't we want some of the people who have repeatedly led us into conflict and suffering and corruption and chaos to make way for these new voices so that they have something different to offer? Frankly, we have no choice in this moment we are in but to change systems. And I do not root for women's leadership simply because it's unfair that we haven't been in leadership for so long. I do this work because I firmly believe that women's leadership is the only thing that we as human business beings have never tried and that it is the only thing that is likely to change the trajectory of civilization going forward. Because let's face it, we have gotten far too good at killing each other, at hurting each other, and at otherwise doing bad things. We can kill more quickly and more inexpensively than we ever have, and now we can do it remotely without ever leaving a little hut on an Air Force base in Arizona. We can manipulate money and markets to drive wealth, as we have for the last 10 years, into the hands of the powerful so adroitly that we have suffocated the very middle class that constitutes the source of that wealth. And we have secured, scoured the earth for cheap labor so thoroughly that we've run out of impoverished companies, cut, sorry, countries to use against one another to drive the cost of labor yet further down. And all the while, the seas rise, the storms get increasingly dangerous, and the fires burn with unprecedented ferocity. It is a time of unprecedented hazard, both physical and moral. So it's gonna be on us women to help the world find its way through this. But the call for us to step into power must be taken seriously. Because up until now, the women and the men who have risen to the call to step into power have more than likely been the people who value power only for its own sake. And those who have gotten there have slouched into the status quo. I fear that up until now, we women have been more changed by power than have changed it. And we need to take a moment and remember why we are here and what our values are. Because if we are not here to shift paradigms, then what on earth does any of us get out of bed every morning to do? Those women in Liberia consciously rejected official leadership until they could cause the terms of the discourse to become more hospitable to the way things needed to operate. First of all, the shooting had to stop. And then they could get down to the details and work their way through to a, a sustainable peace. There will always be women outside of the rooms you're operating in who don't dress as well as you, who aren't as well educated, and haven't learned how to operate up in the clouds with the titans. But they are very important, and we need them because in expressing their priorities, they bring us back into full focus on what, after all, are the things that most powerful people forget most quickly and the things that are most important for us to know. And there has long been a lack of understanding between the women outside the room and the women inside, and that needs to stop. We need to build alliances. Movements, after all, are forming around the world, historical movements empowered by easy access to global social media, and they have increasingly learned to assert themselves, 
to bring accountability to power. We have seen it happen on the small scale around the United States in city halls and on the large scale in bringing successive tyrants down in the Middle East. Their newfound power may seem frightening at first, but again and again, when they have significant numbers of women in their leadership, they have led with demands not to hand power on to the next tyrant, but to build democracy, to restore jobs and education. These are not traditionally thought of as women's issues, but this is always what movements ask for when women are in leadership. Grassroots women. It's famously a Chinese curse to say, may you live in interesting times. And these are very interesting times. <laughs> we are in an emergency state. But it's an emergency and an opportunity. I call it an emergentunity or, or an opportunity. I can't decide which. <laughs> but consider this. The phrase NGO, or non-governmental organization, did not exist until 1950 when it was first coined in a paper UNESCO presented to the United States. And it was descri describing a non-governmental organization that had a beneficial purpose to mankind that got most of its money and its people from outside of official government or international entities. In the US alone today, there are over two million NGOs, and most of those have come into existence in the last 30 years. So I want you to stop and consider that for a minute. Yes, there's been an information revolution. There's been a technology revolution. There's been a travel revolution. There's been a banking revolution in the last 30 years. But alongside all those other revolutions, a quiet but extremely important one has also been unfolding. The industrial revolution didn't have a name until it was almost over. So what are we gonna call this one? Never before have so many individuals chosen not just to give to charity, but to step into careers and lives fully dedicated to the betterment of the human condition, very often foregoing better paying jobs and better paying opportunities to do so. Never before has so much money been funneled into such efforts, and never before have so many people actively committed themselves to the work of making life better for people that they've never met, never seen, and have nothing to gain by helping. And when I say people, I hasten to add what I mean is women. The sector is dominated by, ruled by, powered by women. So consider this. Women have access to power in elected office as they've never had before. Women have access to money and to jobs and to the influence over money as never before. Women are situated at the highest places in international agencies, courts of justice, businesses, banks, and lenders as never before. Women have access to education and media and communication as never before. And women have quietly built wholly unprecedented structure to further the social good quite under our notices and quite without anyone paying attention. So consider what has lined up in front of us in these last 30 years and ask yourself, how do I choose to fit into that? How will I make the difference I can make? How am I uniquely situated on this earth? How do I fit into the efforts of others to maximize my impact and leverage my power? And how do I bring all of myself to every room I go into? These are, I offer, the defining questions of our time. And I suggest we spend the next three days working on it. Thank you. Thank you so much for a riveting presentation. I think it's fascinating to think about these stereotypes, how they evolve over time, and how definitely war is associated with men and caring is associated with women. I would perhaps ask you whether grooming more men to enter the caring professions to, for governments to allow them to become midwives, primary school teachers, and involve fathers, frankly, mm -hmm. um, whether that's the other part of the puzzle. Well, it absolutely is the other part of the puzzle. I, I think that women in, in a business setting can get us leaps and bounds forward in that direction because when women do change the rooms they're in, when they get there in critical mass, I think they also relieve some of the pressure on men to fit into the stereotypes about men that are also as ill-fitting on men as, they are, as our stereotypes are us. So there are plenty of men in rooms right now pretending to be our Sylvester Stallone 
you know, when they're probably more Willy Wonka. And, you know, perhaps, you know, a, a, a critical mass of women in these spaces may change them and free men up to be all that they can be. Absolutely. Let's throw this open. We've got exactly four minutes. I'm going to take three questions, make them short. I'm talking two sentences, quicker than mine. Um, and then we'll have a very quick answer. Can I start collecting questions? Anyone, any questions? Is there a right question? The back, yes, yeah. up there. We'll start with a lady. Um, it's as much a comment, actually, that all the technicians and cameramen here are men, <laughs> and the ushers are women. I just thought that's quite an interesting start to the yeah. day. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> any other questions or comments? This is your chance. Let me then grab my opportunity and ask you one more. Um, last year you did something controversial but very interesting. Um, you basically decided not to accept the profits made by an investment of the Disney family in the West Bank, in an Israeli cosmetics company, Ahava. Um, it was a controversial decision. Uh, you, in the end, actually couldn't end up refusing the money entirely, but you ended up donating it to causes mm -hmm. that fight this illegal occupation, as you called it. So I want to ask you, in this most protracted, perhaps, of conflicts, one of the most longest-running uh, longest conflicts, what can women do okay. there? And do you find that their role has been allowed to blossom a little bit, at least, on the margins? Have you seen this? Right. I, I think where they've been able to blossom is, as you say, on the margins. Um, they're mostly marginalized, by definition, anyway, in both of their societies. Um, and so if they've been able to blossom, it's because nobody's noticing how powerful they potentially can be. So, but that's always been the case for women, in, particularly in conflict situations. Um, they tend to take advantage of the shadows they've been consigned to. Um, I think that some of the best organizing that's being done in the Middle East is being done in, for instance, parent circles, um, mothers who connect over having lost loved ones. And um, there have been a series of women's groups who've worked really hard for a really long time crossing back and forth. But these are, di these are difficult under the best of circumstances. They really need support. Peo uh, earlier talked about women's rights organizations, and um, I would suggest that if anybody wants to be helpful there, we would empower women's rights organizations in the region. Last opportunity for a question. If there aren't any, oh, there is one. Okay, this is the last question in the second row. Okay, I'm Zanele Mabaso from South Africa. I'm one of the I Love to Lead delegates here today. Um, my question is more on um, women leadership, which you spoke most passionately about, and um, I had a deep connection with you in that regard. And um, as a young individual, would like to know, how do we make a way for new voices? Mm. Well, I think that the new voices have to um, have the uh, confidence in themselves to make themselves heard. I don't think anyone's waiting for a new voice to come along. And anybody who has the capacity to speak publicly is delighted enough to have that capacity not to want to give it away to anyone else. Um, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, you know, we can talk as much as we like about the relative merits of leaning in. Um, but leaning in is just precisely what the young, particularly young women, need to do. You need to step into those spaces and you need to take them. Don't wait for an invitation. I think that's a very good note to end this fabulous session with. If you want to speak more to Abigail, there is another session, I'm told, the Interact session later on, later on, on women's rights as an essential corporation. So you will have another opportunity. Please thank Abigail Disney. Thank you. Thanks so much.